Welcome to Mount Marine's Tuesday Night Bible Study. Tonight we will continue our journey through 1 Thessalonians. We invite you to join us for our Sunday worship service, which is held in person and also streamed live on Facebook and YouTube at 10 a.m. Be sure to visit our website and remain faithful in your giving. You may sow into the ministries of Mount Marine Baptist Church by giving online, Text to give at 540-698-0390 or mail to Post Office Box 108, Fishersville, Virginia, 22939. Your generosity will help to fulfill our mission to build disciples and win souls to Christ. You are encouraged to spread the gospel of Jesus by sharing tonight's Bible study with your family and friends. We thank you for joining us for our weekly Bible study. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. God bless you and welcome to Mount Marine Baptist Church. This is the last night for the study of um, 1 Thessalonians. We have 28 verses. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the main um, verses, which is going to be like verses 1 through 22. And then I'm, if I have time, then I'll just um, get through the remaining, which is um, the Apostle Paul's normal um, way in which he closes out um, a letter. But again, this is a day that the Lord has made, and we shall be um, glad in it. And I thank you so much for um, just um, always coming in on Tuesday, um, Tuesdays at 7 o'clock. Um, so that um, you can learn more about um, what the, what does the what does the Bible say to you um, concerning you, and that's the most important that's the more impo most important thing. It's not about you know getting a whole lot of um, head knowledge, but it's it's all it's all about um, getting your heart right with God and also um, with um, people. Let's have a word of a prayer, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you have blessed us with. So, Father, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord God, will lead me, Lord God, into all truths. And that, God, that you will just put me in a place, Lord God, where I will be able to help those, Lord God, that are out there in Facebook and YouTube. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Okay, so here we are, the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Um, starting next week, we'll pick up with 2 Thessalonians. That th that's three chapters. Then after that, we'll go through Philemon. There's only one chapter. And then... Uh, for Mount Marine Baptist Church, guess what, y'all? We will be concluding all of the letters that Paul wrote to the churches and also the pastoral letters that he wrote to Timothy. So let's start. Uh, so last week we talked about um, the return of Jesus Christ, you know, that, that, when, that when Jesus returned, the, the return of Jesus means this, was that those who died in Christ will come with him and that we who remain, that's what the Bible says, we who remain or Christians that are still alive, we will be caught up and meet them um, in, the, in the air. So Paul, he picks up in verse 1, chapter 5, Paul says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anyone to write that to you. <laughs> there, there, there are just some things uh, when it comes to um, our relationship with God. Um, preacher doesn't have to explain it to you. Um, deacon doesn't have to explain it to you. Uh, because some things as a Christian is, I hate to say it, it's common sense. Don't don't over-spiritualize your, your walk with Christ that common sense can't prevail right? Because if you need to know something, um, because, because what Paul is just simply saying is that if you know that something is coming, right, the, the, the smart thing to do is what? Is to get ready for it. Just, 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 Paul is just simply saying, just be ready. You know, not, not to be getting ready, but to be ready. As a matter of fact, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have, you are ready for the return of, of, of Christ. You're growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but you are um, ready. See, 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 people who 
just don't take life serious. They, you know, sometimes you miss out on opportunities because, because you're not ready. You're not ready. So when the opportunities to succeed show up, you know, you miss out. Someone else gets what you could have gotten because you were ill-prepared. So always remember this, young people, the right place at the right time. And always be ready. You know, the elders used to say in the church, be ye, be ye ready, because you just never know, you know, when someone is going to, when someone is going to um, you know, to call, you know, call you. Okay, so so verse verse two, um, Paul says, he says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, some folk, when they read this, you know, they, you know, they get they get goosebumps because it's like, you know, you know, I just want to, you know, I just want to know when is the Lord return? We can have all of these prop, prophetic gestures out there. People are, you know, these, these these super, you know, super prophets. You know, they're out there. You know, you know, Jesus Christ is going to return on, you know, in in twenty twenty four on December the sixth. You know, and and you got these people that believe that mess. And but 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 the text says. The Lord, Jesus, will return like a thief in the night. Jesus even says this. He says, watch this. He says, no man knows the day or the hour in which the Son of Man will appear or return, right? So I'm telling y'all, all that we have is now when it comes to getting ready and being prepared. Because when the Lord returns, you, you, you won't be given a second chance to get, to get ready. Because when he returns, he's just going to show up. He, he's going to show up. He's going to bring those who died in the Lord. Then he's going to just call those who are um, prepared. He's not going to say, hey, 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 uh, hey, uh, Brett Brown, um, you know, I'm going to give you um, two seconds and then I'm and then I'm out of here. No, it's not. It's not going to it's not going to um, be be that way. Um because Jesus Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Jesus says, hey, listen, y'all, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is going to come. When I was in the Marine Corps, you know, we at night when we, when um, the recruits, when, when I was a drill instructor, when the re recruits, when they went to sleep, you know, in the barracks, right, we always had two recruits walking through the barracks, throughout the night, you know, two-hour watches. And we call them fire watches, right? And this is all that God is, God is like this. Hey, listen, be on your J-O-B. Be on your J-O-B. Because Jesus even says in Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse 43, watch what he says, but know this. Because he says, you you just don't know when, you just don't know where, but you do, but, but you do know that Jesus is going to return, right? But then Jesus says in verse 43, he says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house to be broken in, right? And all that Jesus says, listen, some folk are being duped and taken because they're not, you, you know, they're not awake, you know, and I know we have this woke generation, right? And this is all that Jesus said, hey, you got to be woke. You have to know, you know, what's coming down. You know, don't fall asleep on, on God. Now, I've gotten to a place in my life where I won't wait on you if you're not ready. I, uh, okay, okay, I'll wait a few seconds, maybe a minute or two, but I'm not going to let you make me late just because you're not ready. And see, and some Christians have a habit of thinking that the show can't start without them. Now, this is how I am in the um, business meetings because I'm like, they're like, hey, Reverend Brown, you know, uh, brother so-and-so, he called and he said he's on his way. Well, what does that have to do with us getting started on time? We're going to start on time because if not, it becomes a bad habit, right? And I think that sometimes Christians, they're okay with with some of these habits that we have in the church well we gotta well we can't show we, we can't start because you know we're still waiting on we're still waiting on that important person no we're gonna get started right so so when jesus returns right he's not gonna wait on none of us not even me right so we have to be on god this is why proverbs 4 23 says 
above anything else. Guard your heart with all diligence because this, this is where things flow. Everything flow. The issues of life, it flows um, from your heart. You got to you gotta be on your J-O-B. So then Paul picks up in verse 3 and watch what he says. He says, he says because see, he says, this is what the world is going to be saying. Because see, the, word, the, the world doesn't know the word, word of God, and they're going to say there is peace and security. Then all of a sudden, when things are going well, because Jesus Christ, you, you know, I think that people think that when Jesus returns, it's going to be like an apocalyptic moment, right? You, you know, this is after his return, right? Uh, but, 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 but the world is going to be like, man, it's, it's very peaceful. We got a lot of security. You know, everybody's got big bank now. Everybody's doing well. Everybody's living in good homes, you know. And, and, and just when everything is going well, Paul says, then destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, the beauty, the thing about it is, is that they have the opportunity to um, escape, but they did not um, escape because there are there are uh, moments within the Bible, right, where people were like warned, just as Christians are warned, just as the world are are warned about you know accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right? So so Noah, you know, as crazy as it looked, Noah was doing something. Watch this because this is going to mess some of you up right nor began to do something that was never done and he was preparing for something that had never happened before okay noah the noah he warned the people nor he's out there he's he's building this this ark and people are looking at noah build this ark now, I don't know if people, if Noah was saying, hey, listen, y'all, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. You better get ready. No, you know, you better get ready. You know, like the old song back in the 60s, you know, you know. But the thing about it is, is that they looked at Noah as, as if he was foolish. They didn't listen to Noah. And because of that, look at what happens. Look at what Peter, Peter says, because Peter looks back at the historical uh, content and says, and says, Peter says in it that there was only a few people he says eight and all eight folk out of the civilization survived the the, the great flood because they were in the ark the same thing with lot when we look at the when we look at lot when we look at lot the the nephew of abraham right Everyone in Sodom was destroyed except for Lot and his daughters. But watch this. It didn't happen overnight. You know, the people, they were warned because the angels, because the angels even, the angels even said, Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 19, 14. I, I, I should have used uh, the King James version because I love the way the King James puts it out there because the King James says, uh, escape to the mountains because I can't do anything until you get there, right? And that's a word for some people because we see, see the only way that you can escape is that you got to get uh, to um, the, the mountain, right? So, so, so look, look at what happened. Look at, look at what's happening in, in Sudan, right? This is, this is going on even right now, right? Sudan. So, 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 so there, there, there's the civil war that's that's rising right and for years you know the state department they kept they they were warning the u.s citizens for years they were telling them listen it if if you were wise you would leave and watch this now they're caught up in the civil war and what they want now is for the soldiers u.s soldiers to come and risk their lives to bring them out when they had an opportunity even years ago to just walk out, fly out, ride a boat out, however they got out, but they, but, but they had a chance. 
And now, and now that they're in the funk, right, they're thinking that the president ought to stop everything that he's doing to do something when they were warned, right? Paul picks up in um, verse four and then watch what Paul says. Paul is saying this about um, the church in Thessalonica, right? Paul says, but church, listen, you're not in darkness, right? You, if, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and your savior, you're not in darkness. I don't care what your past looked like. You are no longer in darkness. He says, but you are not, not in darkness, brothers, for that day will not surprise you like a thief, right? And, and, and what we have to do is, is that we have to keep reminding ourselves that we're walking in the light, right? Walking in the light. Matter of fact, matter of fact some people, some, some Christians, when they read Revelations, right, if they study Revelations, um, they think that Revelations, the, the, the majority of Revelations has, um, has little to do with um, those that are in Christ, right? It has everything to do with warnings, the apocalyptic um, destruction, God warning the people, you know, more than once, you know, get it right, get it right. And then the ultimate return of Jesus Christ, the, you know, the thousand day um, reign, right? But, but, but all of that darkness that's in Revelations, it has nothing to do with those that are in Christ um, Jesus. Because see, when Jesus returns, he will not be looking for, watch this, because we're not in darkness. He's not going to be looking for perfect people. Your name, that's your your name be, being on the church roll will not mean anything when Jesus returns, right? He's only going to be looking for people who accepted him as Jesus, accepted him as Lord, believed in the heart that God raised him from the dead, right? And because Jesus even Jesus even says in Luke chapter eighteen in in eight, watch what he says. He says Jesus says. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, watch what Jesus is looking for when he returns. Faith. That's it. Jesus is only going to be looking for faith. He's not going to be looking for whether or not you were the popular pastor and you had a sold out church. You know, your church was always packed out, right? No. He, he's going to be looking for a church without a spot or wrinkle. Now, I know that messes up some of your heads because you're like, man, that means spot or wrinkle. That means perfection. Yeah, that means per perfection, but not perfected through what we do, right? But perfected through what Jesus did on the cross, right? Because a church or a person without spot or wrinkle just simply means that you have been covered in the blood of the lamb. So, so Paul picks up in verse, verse um, six, verse five. Let's go back to verse five. So Paul says in verse five, for you are, for you are, because in verse four, he says, you are not in darkness. Verse five, he says, but you are all children of light. Notice he did not exclude anyone. Right. Not even, the, you know, babes in Christ, you know, knowing Jesus one day they were all children of the day. And he says, we are not of the night or of the dark. Right. So. So remember from last week, Paul, Paul explained. What happens to um, the believers when Jesus Christ returns, like I said, it's stated earlier, okay? So when Jesus returns, I'll restate. So when Jesus returns, right, he comes with those who have died, gone on to be with the Lord, right? When he returns, he will call those who are in Christ that, that remain, the Bible says, and they will be caught up. So when we look at this, verse 6, um, 
verse six, it says, so then, since you're not in the dark, since you are children of the light, he says in verse six, he says, watch what he says in verse six. He says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Don't, 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 don't fall asleep on God. See, because see, there are Christians that went to sleep on God in their church family during COVID. And I know that I'm right. And they refuse to get out of bed even still. Oh, they get out of bed to go to work. Oh, they get out of bed, you know, to go and do their shopping and all of that stuff. But I'm talking spiritually. They're still asleep on God. And guess what? You can't use COVID as an excuse anymore, y'all, because it's, it's, COVID is not keeping anyone from doing anything. Matter of fact, I've been back in the building now full time for, for three weeks, right? And I'm trying to get myself, I'm trying to get my head together, you know, because I've been used to working, working from home for almost what, two and a half years working from home. And now all of a sudden I'm back in the building eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, right? But it's cool though. But it's, but it's all right. It's because, because I'm back there you know, with people having fun talking to the people. Then Paul picks up in verse seven and look at what he says. For those who sleep, sleep at night and those who drink and those who get drunk, get drunk at, at night. So, 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 so here, Paul, he just contrasts, he's contrasting what the two activities that take place during the night, that is sleeping and partying. You know, I learned something that um, in Australia, right? Australia, side, you know, side, sidebar, sidebar for a second. Australia, you know that stores in Australia, you know, they close at about 5.30 p.m. during the week. And they're only allowed to operate from about 11 o'clock to 5.30 on, um, on, on Sundays. But see, here in, but see, here in the United States, we are so, you know, we are so free to do anything and everything that, you know, shops can remain open all night long. And, you know, you can, you can, you can do what you, whatever you do Monday through Saturday. Now you can do it on, on Sunday. And maybe that, that is why we have so much trouble going on in our country because there, there are so many distractions now that people are falling asleep on God. Paul picks up in verse eight and look at what he says. He says, but since we belong to the day, because Paul says, hey, you are not in the dark. We are children of the light. But since we belong to the day, he says, let us be sober. And I know earlier in the text, we looked at this, you know, it, it stated that, uh, that those who, Sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. And and then, oh my God, the first, the next, the next verse says, "Let us be sober." Now, and guess what? Sober does not mean not drinking and getting drunk. Sober means self-control, which means that if you drink too much, you lose control. So Paul says, "Let us be sober." Because you can, you can, you can be the opposite of, of, of being sober and not drink anything. How many, how many people have you associated with, right? And they just don't know how to control their mouths, right? Don't know how to control their anger, right? And they just think that they can always go off on people and people are like, oh, just leave that brother alone because that's just how he is. Leave that sister alone. That's just the way he, no. If you are a Christian, you have to have self-control. Somebody say self-control. Look at verse nine. Verse nine said, for God has not destined us for wrath. The children of the dark, they are destined for wrath, right? So, so, so we, children of the light, those that are in Christ, we, our destiny is not the wrath of God, right? But our destiny is, is to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, right? 
um, pur purpose-driven people, they know their craft very well and they are destined to do great things. Because see, when you're destined, guess what, y'all? Nothing. That means no one or no thing can stop you. Why? Because you got destiny in front of you, right? And they will not allow, talking about people that are purpose-driven, talking about people that are destined, right? They won't allow others to pull them down, right? Now, I'm going to help some people out because, because our destiny is not the wrath of God, right? So get it out of your head that God is mad at you because of your past mistakes and your, and your past missteps. Because watch this, regardless of what people say about what you used to do, where you used to hang out, and all that mess that you used to do, because you know what, I, because I know a little bit about being in the mess, right? Because see, all of that was taken care of by the cross. This is why verse 10 says he died for us. This is why we're not driven to the wrath of God because Jesus Christ died for us. Remember, the, remember um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the thief on the cross, right? Because some people think that you have to do so many things. You got to, you know, you have to, you, you have to do, you, you have to, you, you have to pay your way into the, into heaven. You have to do all of these, all of these things. And some folk, some folk don't really know that they're heaven bound because they're looking at what other people do, right? Look at the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, he never went to church. He didn't know anything about anything. He didn't know anything about salvation. The only thing that he knew was that Jesus says this to him, today you shall be with me in, in, in paradise. In other words, his destiny was no longer wrath because Jesus just simply told him, today you will be with me. And, and, and this is why I know that I am not des destined to the wrath of God. It is because verse 10 puts it out there very plain and simple because Jesus Christ died for us so that whether we are awake, that means alive here or asleep with him, we will live with him. Okay. So circumstances does not dictate because if Jesus, because Jesus died for us, therefore we will live with him. Whether we live or die, we will be with him. And we got that from last, last week. So Paul picks up in verse 11 and look at Paul. Now Paul, now Paul sh makes a shift, right? Paul says, now church, since y'all know all of this now, since I've given you this preface, he says, let's talk about how we ought to be among each other. Paul says, therefore, since we know that we're not in the dark, therefore, since we know that we are children of the light, therefore, since we know that we are not destined to the wrath of God, he says, let us encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Encouraging and building one another up, that, man, that is a beautiful thing. See, 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 this is how ministries grow. This is how churches grow. Churches don't grow by churches having programs, right? And I don't know how many times I have to tell people that churches will not grow just because you have a program. Yeah, the people there will come and eat your, people will come and eat your food and listen to the good music and the good preaching, but guess what? They're gone and they're not coming back until you have another program, right? What, what, what grows a church is this, is people encouraging one another and building one another up. Who wants to go to a church when you're always talked about and being put down, right? This is all Paul says. Paul says, 
as Christians, we are not, we, we're, we're not in the dark, so we ought to be not treating people as if we have a dark mindset, right? Show me a church that's bursting at the seams, and I'll show you a people in a congregation that's well connected to, to each other. But then Paul takes another shift because Paul says, church, this is how you ought to be among yourselves. You ought to be treating yourself, treating people in the, in the sanctuary, in the community, those that are, those that have connected to you. He says you ought to encourage them. You ought to build them up because you know what? Let me go back to that uh, scripture. Let's go back because because you 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 never know when people are coming in your coming in the coming in the sanctuary and guess what man they just got a they they just they just got a phone call that one of their family members has has passed and they made it up in their mind that I'm not going to stay home today this morning even though I'm even though I'm broken but I'm going to go into the house of the Lord, right? With the hopes that I can get encouraged through song, through, wor through the word of God, and also someone is going to have an encouraging word that can lift me up. You never know what people are going through. That, that means Anyone that's in that, that, that means sometimes, sometimes your pastors out there in your churches, right? Sometimes from the pulpit, they're preaching, they're preaching and building you up, lifting you up. And guess what? And guess what? They have numbed their feelings so that they could do ministry for you. So Paul takes another shift in verse 12. So Paul says, church, listen, y'all. He says, I urge you, which is another word for I beseech you. He says, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Paul is telling the church, this is how you ought to, this is how the church is supposed to operate. The church is supposed to operate this way, building one another up. And then in verse 12, watch this. Some companies are really good at taking care of their employees. They offer great salaries, benefit packages. And then there are some companies that are not so good at it. And the same thing goes for churches. Some churches are really good at honoring their pastors and others are not so good at it. As a matter of fact, some churches don't even honor the pastor. There, as a matter of fact, sometimes there is more dishonor in our churches towards the pastor than there should be. And the word of God is saying, recognize those who labor among you. Paul is not saying recognize them simply because of their position. Paul says recognize those who labor or those who do the work, right? Because, see, you can have a position and not do any labor. And y'all see that every Sunday in, in, in all of your churches. You have people who have positions, but they don't do anything. They just show up on Sundays. They want to be seen by folk but they don't do anything. Paul says, no, I'm not talking about people who have position. Paul says, no, I'm talking about people that do the work. It's not about the position. Paul is urging the church to recognize it was the labor or what they did that was to be recognized. The, the, the labor in the Greek is kopeo, which means, that, which means working hard, working hard. And I don't need nobody to tell to, to recognize me because I tell y'all this, I work hard. And I'm not I'm not patting myself on the back. I ain't bragging. I'm just letting you know I work hard. 
Paul says they lead you, they admonish you, they warn you. They're the first to show up, the last to leave. So some of the times, most of the pastors that I know, they barely break even when it comes to the salaries that they receive. They're often criticized and rarely encouraged, respect and recognizing them. It, it, it doesn't even cause... It doesn't cost churches a dime to, rec to, to, to recognize and have respect for pastors. It ain't like, you, it ain't like pastors are, are, you know, are getting rich off of churches, right? That is a myth. That is a myth that comes straight from the pits of hell, right? And, and every time you hear this mess, you ought to say, God, you, you, you know what? I don't know what you're talking about. Man, we ain't, we ain't hardly getting to preach nothing, Okay. So, so if you're thinking that we're paying his bills and all that, no. Matter of fact, the preacher's probably doing more for some of the churches than the churches are doing for the preachers. At least respect the dude or the, the, or the sister, right? And I know, and I know that God is not happy with some of these churches and how the pastors have been treated. Oh, I can tell you some war stories. I can tell you about, you know, someone coming up in the church and, and, and stopping the service, calling me outside because he wants to fight in the middle of the service, right? I can tell you about when I went outside, when I, when I went outside you, you know, only to find my car having about $8,000 worth of damage done to it. I can tell you some things. I can tell you about, you know, I had this one pastor friend. He told me, he said, he said, Red Brown, he said man, you ain't going to believe this, man. You know, the church gave me a raise and they, they gave me a raise, but the one that was writing the checks thought that, well, you know what? I controlled the checks. I controlled the purse string. And guess what? Church voted on it. I ain't giving him nothing. And he says, um, he waited for one month. Didn't get the raise. He waited a second month. Didn't get a raise. He says, I'm going to go and give him another month because I just want to see how far he would take it, right? After three months, he goes to the trustees, right? And says, trustees, you know, you know the church voted on the raise, so I need for you to go in and let the person know that's writing the check to start writing the check. Well, got the check, start, she got around to it. But then I had to go, but, but, but then the preacher had to go back, this is what he said, he had to go back and, and, and tell the person, listen, if you on your job got a raise and did not get paid for three months, and when you finally got your raise, what would you get? You get back pay. Well, well, well go back and make it, make it happen. You know, there, there are a whole lot of things that happens in our churches that we do to pastors, and I think that now is the time that we stop, that churches stop. These pastors are working too hard. The majority of the pastors, they don't. They're working nine to fives just like you. Some of them are struggling financially just like some of you, right? They have to leave the birthday parties, the barbecues, Sometimes they can't even go because they're studying and preparing for the word for you. And they're missing out on a whole lot of, of, of life. Kids growing up, grandkids growing up. And they're doing ministry for you. And beloved, the best thing that we can do for our pastors is this. Love on them. Just, just, just respect the sister behind the sacred desk. Respect the brother behind the sacred desk. But Paul's not done yet, because because Paul says in verse in verse thirteen, Paul says, "And to esteem them very highly in love." Here it is, because of their work. Because of their work. Esteem them, build them up very highly in love because of their work. Then he says, church, be at peace with among yourselves. Because see, you can't be at peace among yourselves if, if you're not treating each other right in the body of Christ. You cannot be at peace among yourselves if you don't even know how to respect the leadership of the church, right? This is all that Paul is saying. I'm not saying that this is what the word of God is saying, right? Paul, Paul even writes to Timothy. Paul says this to Timothy, ch chapter 5, verse 17. Paul tells Timothy, he says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy 
of double honor. This is the word of God, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. I don't know. I, I really think that some people think that, you know, well, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to do it, you know, to preach a sermon. You just open up the Bible and, and the Lord would give you everything that you need to say. No, there's a lot of preparation, right? There, there are hours of preparation, you know, well, I can't speak for everyone, but there are hours that I put in to um, preparing the sermon for Sundays, right? To include, you know, the Bible study. What kind of church and members would go around dogging out the pastor? I'll tell you what kind of members, unsaved members. And yes, every church has at least one. Paul says, be at peace. And how can you be at peace when you're not connected? The lack of peace becomes the great divide because it causes distractions in the body of Christ. Then Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the dis disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Paul talks about interpersonal relationships. He says, urge people that are just on the sideline doing nothing and disrupting the flow of the spirit, right? And I know that, you know, most churches have at least a group of people that all that they have on their heart and on their lips is to disrupt the growth of the church because things don't quite go the way in which they want them to go. He says, church, you are responsible for this so that it won't happen. He says, encourage the disheartened. We should be so discerning about the people that we're connected with that we should be able to encourage people that are going through. Help the weak. Help the, and I'm not talking about physically. It doesn't have to mean a person that's physically weak. It could be a person that's spiritually weak, a person that is just going through, don't know how to break the habit. And maybe, and maybe just maybe you're the person that's been through that. And you and you got over it, and you're and you're able to tell him, brother, hey man, this is how I got over it, without judging him. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one to the spirit of meekness, right? And be patient, be patient, not with some, but be patient with everyone. And I struggle with this sometimes. As a pastor, I, I struggle with being patient with everyone, but I have to. I can't, I can't skirt around the issue, but I have to do it interpersonal relationships do not put people in check with when they gossip because because we have to you know Paul said hey put people in check when they gossip knowing that gossip gossip it it what it tears down the church it tears down the community it breaks up families Paul says you ought to be strong enough in the Lord to let people know man no not today or any other day Take that trash outside. Matter of fact, take that trash off the church ground, right? Matter of fact, don't even be texting me about this mess because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear it because if I see it, if I hear it, then I've got to process it, right? Encourage folk, he says. But think about this. Paul was just simply saying, think about it. He said, think about other people. Be a sacrifice. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, Paul says, and see to it that no one repays anyone evil for evil. So Paul picks out, but when, when Paul makes this shift to the church, right, Paul says, listen, y'all got to act like you in love with each other. You got to act like you are a family. Like you, you like 
you, you Paul says, act like you like to be around them, right? Paul says, respect the pastor, honor the pastor. But then Paul, but then Paul says, don't, don't, don't be going around getting even with people. We, you, you, you know, the, that, that, that's what the world um, does. Okay, let me pick up. We got 15 minutes, okay. Then Paul says, because he goes to the individual and he wants the internal to become external. Paul says, rejoice always, praying without ceasing. Rejoice all, rejoicing always is an indication that our circumstances don't dictate the level of our joy. Christian joy must not be confused with shallow feelings of happiness, and happiness is what folk do during the playoffs. Praying with ceasing, praying without ceasing doesn't mean that, hey, I got to stop what I'm doing because I have to get on my knees and I have to pray. No, praying without ceasing means this. My mind is stayed on Jesus, right? I'm constantly in prayer. I'm constantly in prayer for family. I'm constantly in prayer for the church. I'm constantly in, in prayer even for me, right? We're co-workers, right? And people don't need to know that you're praying for them. You know, you see someone, you see someone on your job, you know, they're out there, you know, just a cussing and a fussing. No, you just, you just start praying for the brother or the sister, right? Praying without ceasing. That means that you always have this open communication with God, praying for the people and also uh, situations. Verse 18, um, and I'm going to speed up. Sorry about that, but I just want to get through chapter five on tonight. Hang with me, put on your seatbelts. He says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? Come on now, stop trying to figure things out. The will of God for your life is this, being thankful for what God does for you, right? Being thankful for what people do for you. That is the will of God. It is the will of God to be grateful. And I'm thankful with or without. That's what Paul says. Paul says, I have learned how to abase. I have learned how to be in need. I have learned how to be without. But Paul says, but I have learned that in all things, you know, I'm just thankful, right? Uh, look at verse, verses uh, 19 and 20, two short verses. He says, but Paul says, but whatever you do, he says, watch this. Don't quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies. Two verses, First Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 says, do not quench the spirit. In other words, do not let your bitterness put the fire out in somebody else's life. And you know how it is, some folk, what you so happy for, some people are like, if I'm miserable, you're supposed to be miserable also. And there are people that show up and all that they want to do is just kill your spirit, right? They call them spirit killers. And do not despise prophecies. That, that, that means uh, having issues with prophetic gestures. Prophecy is speaking God's truth and prophetic gestures is putting God's truth into action, right? There's the difference. So it's not so much about what is said that people have issues with sometimes. Sometimes people hate on you because you're doing the right thing. You're helping people out. You know, wait, why is she doing that? She must want somebody to you know, to recognize her or pat her on a bit. No, do not quench the spirit and do not despise God's truth being put into action. But then Paul says, but test the spirit, hold fast to what is good, abstain from everything, every form of evil. Paul says, okay, listen, children of the light, listen, you don't have time to be carrying a whole lot of baggage. So this is how you lighten your load. He says, lighten your load by testing everything. And once you, once you test it, you'll be able to be discerning enough to know that that ain't good for me. That is not good for me and what God has purpose in my life. So I'm going to get rid of that, but I'm going to hold on to the things that are, that are good. Right? So don't be so gullible just because they say that they are Christians separate, keep it, moving verse 23 says now so 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 the remaining of chapter five paul is um paul is sort of kind of doing this uh his his benediction right 23 through 25 so i'm just going to read it and, <clears throat> and you can reread again but if i see something um 
that that jumps out, then I'll then I'll stop for for a second. Okay, all right. So we have ten minutes still. Okay, so Paul is doing what Paul normally does traditionally, closing out the letter. Paul Paul says, "Now may may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless." At the coming of the Lord. So what keeps us blameless at the coming of the Lord? I'll tell you what keeps us blameless. The peace of God that surpasses our understanding. Because he says, may the peace of God sanctify us. So the peace of God or the Holy Spirit, it sanctifies us, which keeps us blameless while we yet wait on the return of the Lord. And in verse 24, Paul says, and he who calls you, watch this, oh, oh my God, I love this one right here. Because he who calls you, watch this, is faithful. And, and y'all y'all sitting around here worrying about people being unfaithful to you. You, you, you. you know what? Think about this one verse right here. He who calls you is faithful. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. God ain't like people, right? He'll never lie to you right? He'll never take advantage of you, right? He who calls you is faithful and will surely, surely what? Do it. Won't he will? Yes, he will. Then in verse 25 through 26, he says, brother, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Then you just work on your handshakes now. But that was the, um, the culture of the time. Then he says, he says, I put you under this oath, verse 27. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. He says, Paul, Paul, Paul says, don't, 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 don't keep this to yourself. Don't be a hoarder. Make sure that everyone gets a chance to hear what I wrote to the community and also to the church. Then he closes out in verse 28, and he says, To the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless you. First Thessalonians 5 chapters. We got it. We succeeded. We made it. Okay? And I just want to thank you again, you know, for just hanging in tough with us at Mount Marine Baptist Church on Tuesday nights at 7, at 7 o'clock. Okay? So starting next week, Starting next week, starting next week, we will begin the study of 2 Thessalonians. I'm excited about it. There's only three, three chapters, three chapters of 1 Thessalonians. And then after that, we're going to go to the small letter, this little itty bitty letter that Paul wrote called to Philemon, right? It's one chapter. After we get through 2 Thessalonians and Philemon, we will be concluding the studies of all of the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote, the general epistles, which means the letters that he wrote to the church, and the pastoral epistles, those letters that he wrote to, um, to, the, um, to, to, to Timothy, first and, first and second Timothy. Okay, again... Thank you very much for um, taking your time out with us. Oh, remember last week I told you about um, after Philemon, I don't know where I'm going in regards to a book or study, right? But it, just, just like I said last week, if you know of what you would like to um, be taught, whether it's a book or maybe it's like a subject, Reach out to me, send an email to the church. You know, the email, church's email is out there on, on the church's website. Or just make a comment. YouTube, make a comment in YouTube or either on Facebook. It's, hey, you know, Pastor Brown, I would really love to learn more about, you know, whatever that subject matter is. And I will do my best um, to accommodate, to accommodate um, you on that. Again, thank you very much much and i'll see you next tuesday at seven o'clock got another announcement to make at mount marine baptist church we do not have services on fifth sunday this 
Sunday is the fifth Sunday, so uh, no services, um, and I'll be going somewhere. Don't know where I'm going, but I will be going somewhere, probably in Northern Virginia somewhere, so I can go somewhere and be an unknown stranger in the in a sanctuary. God bless you again. Father, we thank you, Lord God, and we bless your holy name for uh, just, just, just giving us your word, Lord God, and just helping us to grow in the knowledge of your word. God, I pray that you would just bless the people that are that are just hungry for your word, that are continually and constantly coming out to, to learn what does the Lord say about me in the word. Help us, Lord God, to grow. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Again, God bless you and be encouraged. This concludes our journey through 1 Thessalonians. Thank you for joining Mount Marine's Tuesday night Bible study. Tonight's Bible study will be available on Apple Podcasts. Join us again next Tuesday at 7 p.m. as we begin our journey through 2 Thessalonians. Have a blessed week.